the way guns were portrayed in the Siege of Jadotville was really good. Like, all the guns are right. Uh, they did a really good job of it, except for that one, that one stupid scene that they had to do that just... Uh, Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and uh, in 1961, on this date, the Siege of Jadotville was actively going on. It was a, it's a really interesting uh, vignette, I suppose, in uh, the decolonialization wars of Africa, and it's something that was largely unknown, uh, largely forgotten and unknown, until Netflix came out with this movie about it a couple years ago. Now in general, the movie does a really good job, especially when it comes to the guns. Now they oversimplify the political situation that was going on, and the motives, and sort of the big picture part, but the big picture in Congo in 1961 was so complicated and multifaceted that they have to simplify it. There's no way, like if they tried to adequately explain that whole situation, that would have been the whole movie, and there would have been no gun battle at all. This is. This is an action movie, it is about the gun battle, it is about the Irish troops who are there. And so I'm perfectly happy to just discard any complaints about the big picture. Now when it comes to the guns, they do a really good job. The guns that are shown are just what the Irish had. They had Swedish K M45B submachine guns, which is what you see used. They had Fowls, they had Bren guns, they had Lee Enfield number one, uh, number four Mark One T snipers would have been their precision rifle. The Irish would adopt the FN Mag in, I believe, 1964. Siege of Jadaville takes place in 1961, so the Bren is the appropriate support weapon that they would have had, that they did have, as well as, of course, Vickers guns. Now. One disappointing thing about the guns, and sort of the guns, sort of the equipment, is the Irish actually, that contingent had a pair of old Vickers equipped armoured cars, and those would have been really cool to see in the film. But I get it, uh, they scaled down the whole contingent, it was supposed to be a hundred and, it was originally 155 Irish troops, they scale it down to make the whole movie a little more manageable, and with the number of troops they have those armoured cars would have, I feel like, kind of overwhelmed a lot of the the scenes that they were in. Anyway, I get it. But that one stupid scene with the Bren gun really bugs me. And maybe it's because I'm too nitpicky, but it's one of these things where they don't just make an accidental oopsie mistake. They make like a specific scene deliberately about this thing that is a complete bogus myth. And that myth is the Bren gun was such an accurate weapon that it was effectively a sniper weapon. And you'll see this in, in two different constructions. One of them is the Bren gun was too accurate. And if you, like, the, the point of a supporting uh, fire machine gun is to create a cone of fire and a zone of impact where all the bullets hit, and you want it to have some nice dispersion so that you can hit a wide area target with a bunch of troops in it. And the Bren gun was so dastardly accurate that it would just basically make one hole at long range, and so you had to like take special care to make sure that you disrupted its accuracy to have it effectively work as a support weapon. And that's bogus. It's totally bogus. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where that myth comes from. I've heard reference that it may have come out of um, Roy Dunlap's Ordnance Goes Up Front book, as far back as World War II itself. But we know that it's bunk because you can actually go look up the British firing tables for the Bren gun, and like the expected zone of fire, a zone of impact, the, the impact area for a 10 round burst of a Bren gun at 300 meters was approximately, or 300 yards, was approximately one and a half by two feet. So we're talking, and they have these charts, like expected horizontal and vertical dispersions for the Bren gun out to 1200 yards, and essentially we're talking about a four to five minute of angle gun. So the way this myth manifests in the Siege of Jadaville is with the idea, the laughable idea, that the Bren gun is a better precision weapon than the sniper's purpose-built sniper rifle. Uh, in the movie, the unit sniper has one of these. He has a number four Mark I T, an accurized scoped Enfield, and he's shown using it very effectively. He makes a bunch of very good hits, there's never any implication that it's somehow subpar, and yet there's one scene in there where the evil mine owner shows up and they spot him, and this by the way is one area where they've kind of oversimplified the actual political bigger picture situation, but again, we'll ignore all of that. They decide the commander, Commandant Quinlan, decides that guy needs to get shot. 
uh, because it'll break up the attack, which it does. And so they call the sniper, and then, like, ludicrously, the sniper gets rid of his sniper rifle and grabs the brand gun. Sniper! And you hit the schoolhouse! Yeah! Right on a single shot! And then what he does is he pulls the magazine, uh, loads a single cartridge into it, so pulls the magazine off, locks the bolt open because the Bren gun fires from an open bolt, which should be your first clue that it is not a precision weapon. Uh, he loads one cartridge in and takes careful aim and blammo hits the guy right in the chest and guy goes down and the attack breaks up and it's all successful on to the next scene. Uh, the problem here is the Bren gun just is not the right weapon to use there. So we already talked about the actual accuracy, of mechanical accuracy of a Bren gun. Um, although to be fair that's in burst, but we're talking about an open bolt gun here with a rather heavy uh, set of moving parts that are all locked to the rear of the gun. When you pull the trigger there is a remarkably long lock time. This is typical with uh, open bolt guns. So you pull the trigger and the the bolt has to move all the way forward. It'll Normally it would pick up a cartridge from the magazine. There is no magazine in this case, the round is already in the chamber. It then chambers the round, and as soon as it slams forward into the back of the barrel, it detonates the round and fires. So the idea is they're single loading a round because it's more precise, because there's no variability of how it might feed into the chamber from the magazine. The reality is there's no baseline, so there's just as much uh, as much um, unreliability in the exact positioning of that cartridge by hand as there would be from the magazine, and on top of it that doesn't really matter. Um, the ability to make a good shot with the Bren gun is substantially harder than making a good shot with the sniper rifle. And they're the exact same cartridge, by the way, so there's no difference there. When you pull the trigger on the rifle, the firing pin drops, it weighs very little, and it with almost no lock time, the, the time differential between when you pull the trigger and when the cartridge actually fires, there's almost zero perceptible lock time on a rifle like an Enfield. On a Bren gun there's very perceptible lock time, and at the same time you've got a big chunk of metal slamming forward that throws your aim off. Um, so the Bren gun is going to be mechanically less accurate than the sniper rifle. Second issue is the sniper rifle has a scope on it. This dude is at long range, that's made very clear. Uh, he's going to be a lot easier to see and to properly aim at with a magnified optic than with the plain open aperture sights of the Bren gun. Uh, interestingly, sort of a secondary little, what, what I would consider just an oopsie, not a big deal goof, is when they show the sniper sight picture in the Bren gun, there's no front sight there. Like, it's a little bit ironic that they go through all the motions of making the Bren look like a precision weapon and then they don't give it a front sight. Like, the whole most important thing is focus on your front sight. Make sure your front sight is crisp, in focus, centered in that rear aperture, and at the appropriate place where you want to hit. But there is no front sight present. Oops. So anyway, uh, what the movie does, and it's it's not an accident because there's clearly a significant amount of effort put into writing this, uh, this scene in the script. It's not just coincidental, it's not just, it can't possibly have been just what was easy and readily available. It's, and it's not even what you would naturally assume. This is someone who had to be familiar with this myth and thought it was real in order to deliberately show the sniper not using his sniper rifle that he's already holding on to, and instead using a support machine gun to make a precision shot. Anyway, uh, that's probably as much ranting about that as I need to do for today. Like I said at the beginning, I enjoy the movie. Uh, there's not a huge depth of character development to it, but as, as a technically accurate war action movie goes, it's a fantastic example. And if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to watch it. And if you find it interesting, hey, it's a great starting place to read up on the incredibly complicated uh, world of the Belgian Congo and its independence in the 1960s. So uh, I don't want to come across as someone who just hates all movies because I find one little thing to nitpick in them, but this is a place where the movie reinforces something that's just really stupid and they shouldn't have. Anyway, Hopefully you enjoyed this video as much as I did enjoy Siege of Shadowville. Thanks for watching.